Hello, everyone, and welcome to tonight's virtual program. I'm Emily. I'm one of the librarians here at Rockland Public Library, and we're thrilled to have Laurie Chandler tonight for our author talk. Uh, I want to start tonight off with a couple quick programming notes. Uh, next week on January 28th, we have new Maine professor Liam Riordan discussing Maine's bicentennial and issues that arose during the statehood process. And the following week on February 4th, we have author, photographer, and columnist Don Reimer, who will discuss his new book, Seen Anything Good, which talks about birding in Maine. Uh, and I'm happy to introduce tonight's speaker. Bremen, Maine's Lori Chandler has been grateful to call Maine home for many years. She treasures the small moments she spends snowshoeing, swimming, and discovering new wildflowers as much as her grand adventures. Formerly a research forester, Lori, Lori currently works in middle school special education. And I'll turn it over to Lori. Thank you, Em. And I want to start out by thanking the Rockland Library for hosting this talk tonight. And um, this is only the second talk that I've done about this trip and my newest book. So it's still very exciting and new for me. And I have um, a couple show and tell items before I put my slideshow up. And so I'm going to do that now. And you'll be hearing a lot tonight about Katahdin Woods and Waters National Monument. And I wanna make sure that I do not forget to tell you that the monument has a friends group. And I see Andy Bossi is with us tonight and he heads up the Friends of Gatan Woods and Waters. And so their website is a very good place to go if you wanna plan a trip there. And there's a couple of publications I just wanted to show you. There's a map for the Loop Road, which I'll be talking about in a little while. And then there's a waterproof a uh, monument map that covers the whole monument. That's a good resource. Both of those are put out by the Friends Group. And then I also wanted to show you before I get started, the um, kind of journal that I use when I'm out on my trips. And it looks like this. And this is what I fill up with all my little scribbles and then come home and, and turn that into a book. So I know an hour goes by super quickly. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my, um, slideshow and we'll get started. All right, there we go. All right, so in 2018, I took a pretty amazing trip that um, turned into my second book and so that's what is going to be the subject of our talk tonight. And the title of the book is Through Woods and Waters, A Solo Journey to Maine's New National Monument. And I started out um, my writing career in, with a book that was published in 2017 about a journey I did on the Northern Forest Canoe Trail. And if you're not familiar with the trail, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about it because Part of my journey that I'll be talking about tonight incorporates a little bit of the Northern Forest Canoe Trail. But the trail follows native waterways from Old Forge in the Adirondacks to Fort Kent, Maine. And as you can see, it's 740 miles and incorporates 22 different rivers and streams and 56 lakes and ponds. And those are all connected um, by portages. So in the end, I ended up doing 67 portages on that trip. And in that case, I would say that the book kind of came out of the trip. I, I really wanted to challenge myself by, by trying to do a journey that I actually wasn't sure if I was going to be able to um, even finish unassisted, which was my goal. But I did the journaling as I went along and um, it took me about two years to write that book, which as I said, came out in 2017. And I found out that I really enjoyed being an author. And I particularly enjoyed going out and telling people about the Northern Forest Canoe Trail and, and going to paddling shows and festivals and all that sort of thing. So along about 2017, not too long after this book um, was out there, I decided that I, wanted to do another trip. And I knew that I wanted to do something else up in the North Woods. And in the uh, preface to this book, 
I write when you have traveled far in the northern forest, known its rhythms and become part of them for a time, the woods and waters call you back to places where human voices hush and nature speaks. And I believe that's really true. I feel like once you've immersed yourself in, in a long journey like that, and um, especially when you go solo the way I like to, you just continue to feel a pull to go back and, and, um, and plan another trip. And I wanted to make this trip um, in 2018 include a lot of the challenges and joys that I had during my Northern Forest Canoe Trail through Paddle, which took 53 days. So I knew this was gonna be a shorter trip, but I wanted to still incorporate a lot of the um, same things that had challenged me in, in that longer journey. So this time, I guess you could kind of say that the book led to the journey because I wanted to write another book and I was um, really searching for what would be a good route and a good destination. And I decided that there was nothing better than to go and explore Katahdin Wood, Woods and Waters National Monument, which was only two years old at the time that I went there. And I begin by showing you one of the two maps that's in my book. And um, they were done by a friend of mine, Arnie Aho. And I saw earlier that he's with us tonight. So I really just want to give him all the credit for how this turned out. I really had a vision that I wanted to have old fashioned style maps in my book. And in order to get inspiration and to try to figure out what we might want them to look like, we went to some of our favorite authors. And this happens to be a map on this slide from a book by Sigurd Olson called The Lonely Land which tells the story of a journey that he made uh, on Canada. And so Arnie and I both pulled our favorite books off the shelves that had maps of this type and, and spread them all out and talked about what we liked from each one and um, had a lot of fun doing it. And so Arnie went away and did his wonderful work and he came back and um, over the course of quite a few months, we ended up with the two maps that are in the book. And I discovered that I have a feature, oops, it's not what I wanted to do, a feature in PowerPoint where I can get a little laser pointer. So I'm gonna do that and I'm gonna walk you through um, my journey. And you'll see as we go along that I actually had a, a part of the time when I backpacked and I did the backpacking journey first but I will tell you about that part a little bit later. And then I had to come home to do an author event. And then I went back and did the canoe trip. Um, the canoe trip was 190 miles long. It was 150 miles just to reach the monument boundaries. And then a little over 40 miles down through the monument. So if you're familiar with Maine geography, um, we're on Sabumook Lake. This is Moosehead over here. And I started on the west end of Sabumuk, which I had never paddled before. Went through there. Um, and the west branch of the Penobscot I'd been on quite a few times, but not on the first little section right here, which actually turned out to be one of the most challenging parts of my trip. It's called the roll down section of the west branch. And I continued along. I went into Lobster Lake, if any of you have been in there and camped for the night. And you can see on the map, these little triangles designate my campsites for each night. Continued up the West Branch. And this is all part of the Northern Forest Canoe Trail in here, which was kind of neat. And the Northern Forest Canoe Trail has a uh, designated route that most people take. And then it also has some little alternative routes that you can take if you want to. And we're just about to enter the Allegash, Allegash Wilderness Waterway here. And most people um, enter the Allegash by going across the top of Chisuncook Lake and across Mud Pond Carry and into the Allegash that way. But you can also take a loop 
that goes around like this, takes you into Allagash Lake, and then around into the Allagash that way. So it was it was really appealing to me to explore this little part of the Northern Forest Canoe Trail that I had never done before. And this incorporated a little bit of upstream travel right here. And that was another really difficult section. I ended up um, having to walk maybe a mile and a quarter through rapids, just um, dragging my canoe or carrot, well, it was, it was floating, but holding onto my canoe with one hand and um, holding onto the bushes and, and shrubbery along the shore with my other hand, just so I wouldn't lose my footing. So I went around this way and then now I'm in the Allagash on Chamberlain Lake. And then I went down into Telos Lake. And a lot of this route also follows um, the Rose route in 1857. And I'll show you a couple pictures of that later on. And then I went across the top of Baxter State Park on um, Webster Lake and Webster Brook, and then into a lake called Grand Lake Matagammon. And I had come all this way before I reached the monument boundary. And then I went down the east branch of the Penobscot, which goes right through the heart of the monument and went about nine miles from the point where the east branch and the west branch were joined together to form the main Penobscot. And I took out at Grindstone picnic area. And just to look at the map, Arnie designed the compass rose and he did the illustrations. This mother doe and fawn had a special significance for me. And um, so I really can't thank him enough for doing that. So I thought I'd give you a little look, a look at some of the um, obstacles that um, reminded me so much of the Northern Forest Canoe Trail. And one of those was um, right here. This is the roll dam section of the West Branch. So this is what I would have been looking at uh, my first afternoon um, of the trip after I went through Sabumuk Lake. I started into the section, this section of the river where there's about 13 of these ledge drops. And this is the worst one of them, but most of them I had to figure out a way to carry my canoe around them. And I actually got caught out by darkness the first night and ended up camping um, along the Portage Trail right next to this particular rapid. Um, sometimes there was not enough water. I might be going downstream or I might be going upstream. This happens to be on Allagash Stream just after I left Allagash Lake. But that certainly reminded me a lot of the 150 miles or so of upstream travel on the Northern Forest Canoe Trail. I had plenty of experiences on large windy lakes. This is Telos Lake um, in the Allagash Wilderness Waterway. And I had more than one improvised campsite. So I told you about having the camp next to that um, ledge drop on the West Branch. And this is my last night. I was actually past the monument and there weren't really any designated campsites. So here I am camped on a, a midstream island in the East Branch and this was my last night. And this is the other map Arnie did. And so this is a close up of just the monument and I'm gonna get my laser pointer back again, hopefully. All right, there we go. So there's two entrances to the monument. You can come in um, at the north end from Patton, or you can come in at the south end um, from Stacyville. From Route 11, you come in on the Swiftbrook Road, and there's a loop road that's about 16 miles long at the south end of the monument. And so this is a good way to explore that end if you're going to be coming by car and there's numerous opportunities to hike off of the loop road. And so that was the first map that I showed you. Um, actually talks about the different um, overlooks and things on the loop road. So I started my backpacking trip right about here. And I followed this 
winding route like so, and you can see my campsites again. I ended up um, camping four nights on the backpacking part and doing about um, 30 miles. And I came out up here. <clears throat> so when you think about all there is to discover at Katahdin Woods and Waters National Monument, it's really almost mind boggling. And in a one hour talk, I can't really do justice to all of it, but I'm gonna to try to take you through some pictures and hit some of the highlights. Um, as far as the antiquity of the area, the geology goes back hundreds of millions of years and human presence on the river goes back at least 8,000 years. And the river has a lot of cultural and spiritual and historical importance to the Wabanaki, but it was also used um, for many thousands of years before that. Um, I've got the dark night skies up there and it was really um, a victory for the monument when they became designated as a dark sky sanctuary last year, one of only 13 in the world. And the dark night skies are among the darkest east of the Mississippi. Um, there's a scale that measures how dark skies are called the Borman is a two on that scale compared to one being like in Antarctica and nine being an inner city, really brightly lit area. So um, just beautiful to see the Milky Way and, and, um, and all the other stars at night, which is certainly something I got to do um, at my various campsites. So this is a shot from the Loop Road. Um, there's a number of places you can stop and the miles, the mileage um, stops are numbered like they are on the Skyline Drive, for instance. So this is at mile 6.4. Um, and you really have a beautiful view um, in two different directions. And there's these really neat um, wooden panels that show you all the mountains that you're looking at. So the trail that I was um, backpacking on is called the International Appalachian Trail. And I know all of you have heard of the Appalachian Trail, but the International Appalachian Trail kind of picks, off where, picks up where the AT leaves off in Maine and goes for currently right now, there are 5,000 or so miles of trail that are included in the IAT with the potential to eventually maybe get 10,000 miles altogether. And the very first 30 miles of this trail cross the National Monument. And the main chapter of the IAT puts out a trail guide. And that's what I used to navigate as I went along. And a lot of the um, trail is along logging roads, old abandoned, or still in use tote roads like the one you see here. Um, but there's also some regular trail that climbs the mountain peaks and that, that sort of thing. So these are just some scenes from along the trail. And you access the IAT at mile 11.8 of the loop road. So as I said before, this was the first thing I actually did. So it was July 8th, 2018 and my mom and dad dropped me off there and I went on my way. And the first mountain that you can climb is called Barnard Mountain. And this would be a good day hike for anybody that might wanna go up and explore just for the day. Cause you can drive, like I said, to mile 11.8 of the loop road. And it's about two miles each way to get in and climb the mountain. And the elevation is just over 50 feet. And that water you see in the picture is Katahdin Lake. And on the right, you can see what the blazes look like. So this is how the IAT is blazed. And um, so I followed those. And this gives you an idea of the scope 
of the International Appalachian Trail. And the reason why it's all part of one trail is because um, about 400, almost 400 million years ago, the Appalachian and Caledonia Mountains formed. And at that point, um, it was all one landmass. And then later on, when it split apart, when Pangaea split apart, you ended up with part of the same mountain range on both sides of the Atlantic. So everything that you see in gray here is all the same um, geological um, mountain range, really. And the trail started out, the International Appalachian Trail started out as an effort between Maine, Quebec, and New Brunswick to um, establish trail, the trail through those areas. And then from there, it just grew throughout the rest of the maritime provinces in Canada, and then kind of leaped the Atlantic. And in some places, it's, it's new trail um, over in Europe. In other places, it just incorporates trails that have been around for a long time. So as I was hiking, um, thought I had a picture in here of the campsites. So I'm going to talk about the camping, and then I'll go back to the other ones. So there's um, a series of campsites along the IAT and the monument, and several of them also have lean-tos where you can camp. And I always get um, a lot of questions about just the logistics of camping. So I use a lot of the same equipment for backpack as I do for the canoe trips, and you can see a lot of it in that picture in the bottom left. So I have a, a single lightweight backpacking tent, um, a stove that runs on isobutane cartridges. Um, all the water along the way has to be filtered. So I have a water filter for that. And um, for safety, I carry a spot satellite messenger with me. And so I'm capable with that device of sending messages to family and friends that I'm okay. And I can also activate the tracking feature on it. And people that have access to the data can watch my progress, my little dots go along the trail. And then it also has a 911 button, which I have, haven't ever had to use, but it's really nice to know that I have it if I need it. Um, if you're interested in going and, and camping in the monument, all the campsites are first come, first serve. Um, you need to have a fire permit from the main fire service if you want to have a campfire. And you now it's just some of them are so beautiful. Sit right next to um, some of the rapids that I'll show you later on. Oh, and people are people ask me about food a lot too. On the backpacking portion of this trip, I actually bought. Um, dehydrated meals from a company called Good To Go, which makes um, really delicious all natural meals right here in Kittery, Maine. But when I'm river, I tend to just take a mix of food that I put together myself. Um, I eat a lot of tortillas, trail mix. Um, I make a lot of wraps and eat a lot of tuna and peanut butter and jelly. And, um, don't really buy the pre-packed dehydrated meals too much when I'm on the river. So, oh, let's go backwards again. Forgot I didn't do that. Okay, so after you um, climb Barnard Mountain, if you choose to, then as you continue to follow the IAT, it goes up and over um, a couple of the other highest peaks in the monument. And as it climbs Deasy Mountain, which is the highest um, mountain whose summit is actually in the monument at I think 1,942 feet. You pass this cabin, which was the um, home for the fire wardens that worked um, up on the top of the mountain where there is uh, what they call a ground cab or a fire cab. So it's sort of like a fire tower, only it's not up on a tower. It just sits right on the ground. And um, I'm not sure if we have um, Kathy Tate with us tonight or not, but I'm hoping we do. She said she was going to 
try to participate. And um, she is an example of how you make friendships in the process of researching a book and, and trying to get permissions and trying to get um, clarification of questions and that kind of thing. And a friend of mine gave me a book that was called um, The Call of Katahdin. And it was written by um, Kathy Tate's parents or by her father. And his name was Ed Warler. And he was a, um, he was a fire warden here in the late 1940s. So I found this book and I wanted to write about their experience there. And then I also wanted to use some quotes and I'm gonna actually read you a page from the book just to give you an idea of the kind of stories that I like to include as I go along. Um, but anyway, the book was out of print. And so I had to track down somebody that could give me permission to use the quotes. So I found, found out Kathy's name and then I friended her on Facebook and ended up um, getting permission that way. And she was very kind as almost everybody is in letting me use quotes and have permission to use their photographs and or read portions of the text. I find that everybody's always very generous with that. Now, here we go with the page from the book. So I, I I put this into the story as I do with all of these stories at the point where I've actually um, arrived at the fire warden's cabin. And I just um, went over to the stream that went next to it and I, I filtered some water. And um, right after I tell that, I, uh, right later I was given a glimpse into several summers spent here in the late 1940s. On July 5th, 1947, Ed Whirler, his wife, Mary Jane, and their two dogs arrived here for the first time after a long canoe trip and a two mile uphill climb. They did not even know in advance how many rooms the cabin had. MJ carried a radio, her ukulele, and a loaded backpack. Ed carried an army duffel, lineman's tools, and extra insulators to repair the telephone wires strung along the route. Sometimes the lines came down when a moose became entangled in the wire. The couple would have a crank phone connecting the cabin and tower with each other and the main forest service in Stacyville. In his book, The Call of Katahdin, Ed tells of life as a fire tower lookout. The cabin sat in the middle of a small open clearing by the same stream, of course. And that would be the stream I just pumped the water from. A cave of sorts had been dug into the bank with wooden walls, roof, and door to serve as a cold cellar. Inside the cabin, the wood cook stove, this is when they arrived. Inside the cabin, the wood cook stove held a greasy frying pan and the sink was full of dirty dishes. But for a young ambitious couple, who aspired to one day own a main sporting camp, it was heaven. Up on Dacey Mountain, as it was spelled back then, Ed vigilantly kept watch every day that it didn't rain. There were other tasks as well, maintaining the trail, monitoring a rain gauge, cutting stove wood, and conducting an annual insect survey. For fun, Ed and MJ fished, had picnics, and even entertained the more adventuresome of their friends. Homemade donuts with mashed potatoes in the recipe were quote, standard procedure in the North Country. MJ went through flour in 25 pound bags, baking bread, pies, and cakes as well. My favorite story comes from their second summer on the mountain in 1948. Friends of a friend would be flying over and wondered if there was anything they could drop off. That hot, hot July day, Ed and MJ asked for ice cream. <laughs> and this is Ed's words. Sure enough, when the day came, MJ and I were at the tower watching for the delivery. On the first run, their plane, 
their plane buzzed the mountain and they waved and yelled hello. The next run was a little higher and down floated two little homemade parachutes with containers of vanilla ice cream packed in ice. We had to search through the bushes to find them, but oh, weren't they good. So that is the kind of thing I like to find and stick into my story somewhere. And this was really neat. You could still go inside the cabin and um, I hadn't read Ed's book yet at that time. So I was kind of guessing the layout and what the different rooms had been used for. And I think I got it pretty much right. So then you go down off of Deasy Mountain and you go up the next mountain, which is called Lungsus. And at the top, it's um, there isn't much vegetation. So you're usually following these cairns of rocks. And after I went up and over the summit and started to come down the other side, I just plain lost the trail. Um, I couldn't find any of the blazes. And there'd been some other places where instead of those metal blazes, there were little pieces of flagging. But I just kept circling around and I kept coming back to the same point where there just wasn't anything after you know, a certain point. And so I actually got a chance to do what we all read about. You know, you don't go running off in a panic, but you sit down where you are. And um, in my case, I drank the last of the water that I had with me and had a snack. And I pulled out my GPS that I carry. And I had a couple of different paper maps, one of which was the topo map from the Delorme Atlas. And I just sat there until I could orient myself in the direction where I knew the campsite was. And I had about a mile to go and I just bushwhacked and um, nothing ever looked so good as when I came out on this little brushy old road, really close to the campsite. And there was one of those blazes on the tree. And I'm like, yes, I found it. So that was pretty cool. And I was so tired that night. I couldn't, I tried to eat and I couldn't even eat. Um, I felt nauseous and I just went to sleep. So we saw this one already. And after you climb the mountains, then you get a chance to get a look at the East Branch, which is the river that I would be paddling down um, in a couple of weeks. So one of the real bonuses to going um, up along the I I IAT was to get a chance to um, scout some of the rapids. And um, this is actually the last one that you see going north along the IAT and the first one that I would come to later on when I came downstream. And I don't know if you can see in the picture, but right in the middle, there is a little red spot and that is a canoe. And in the canoe were two, as it turned out, very experienced whitewater guides for Camp Chewanke. I didn't know it at the time. And just by coincidence, as I feel like happens often when you're out there on the trail, our paths just happened to cross. So they were coming down this river and they were probably only at this rapid for maybe half an hour. I mean, they stopped to eat a little bit and no. the trail, and then to um, go through and run it. Meanwhile, I was trudging in the other direction. I'd been out there for three days already and we met. And it was really neat because um, number one, they let me film them coming down through Stair Falls, which is what this rapid's called, which was kind of fun. And then they also offered to send me their trip notes. And they had done a lot of what I was about to do two weeks later in my canoe. I was very generous of them. And in order for them to get me the trip notes in time, they had to go home, type them up really quickly, email them to my dad so that he could bring them to me on the river when he came to resupply me halfway through. And they did all those things. And it was really fun because then I had their account of having gone um, the same way I was about to go. And when you think about it, if you're going to write a book, about a solo trip. You don't really have a lot of other characters most of the time. So it's really fun 
when you meet somebody along the way or when you have someone's trip account from long ago of having done the same thing. Or in this case, I met these two fellows who went by the trail names of Goose and Maverick. And I ended up incorporating a lot of their thoughts and experiences into the book as well. So after I left Stair Falls, um, I pretty much was um, done with having my little look at the river. And um, I was actually about to leave the monument and I'd really, really been hoping to be able to see a moose in the monument. And I hadn't in spite of a lot of looking. And I was just at the very edge. We were really um, in a spot here where I could see the little brown sign that says leaving Katahdin Woods and Waters National Monument. And I finally found my moose. And also that snapping turtle was right in the middle of the road a little bit earlier than the moose. And um, I got right down on the road and in his face to take that picture, which is one of my favorites from the, from the trip. So that is the end of the backpacking part. And as usual, I have all kinds of notes here that I was supposed to be going by and that I really didn't look at very much. Um, now one of the things I was going to say on this slide or somewhere I wanted to say it anyway, the monument has um, 37 different natural communities in it and they are classified by something called the main natural areas program categories for different communities and of those three of the communities are imperiled and seven of them are rare so there's a lot of um, diversity within the acreage and I which I also didn't say I think the the total is 87,000 either 543 or 563 acres altogether in the monument. So anyway, now we're um, back to the canoe trip. And as you could see from the map when I went through it before, I kind of took the long way around. I'm not really sure anybody else is ever gonna come to Katahdin Woods and Waters National Monument exactly the way I did unless I get really famous. And then there'll be a map that says the Chandler route and maybe somebody will come. But <laughs> anyway, um, I'm really glad that I chose to go the way I did. Um, and I wish I could show you pictures from every little step of it, but there just wouldn't, wouldn't be enough time to do that in an hour. But these are um, a few scenes from the Allagash Lake Loop and that was where I saw the bulk of the moose that I saw on the trip. I saw one in the monument when I was backpacking and one in Lobster Lake and one on the west branch of the Penobscot. But then when I turned off of Chisuncook Lake and headed up towards Allagash Lake, there's a section um, on a stream called Cockmagomic Stream. And the picture that I had on the opening slide um, with the evening light and the moose standing out there. That was from the first campsite on Cockmagam Extreme, which is called Canvas Dam. And um, I love that campsite. I love this whole section. So you paddle up Cockmagam Extreme, and then you get to Black Pond, which is, I don't know, five or six miles long. And um, then you go back into Cockmagam Extreme, and that was the section where I had to have, I mean, walk up through the rapids holding onto the bushes. And in that, in that stretch, I think I saw five moose. And then I camped that night at Cockmagam Dam and then went up a, a little stream called Sis Stream through Round Pond across the portage and into Allagash Lake. And if you ever have a chance to get to Allagash Lake, I would highly recommend it. It's the most remote of the lakes in the Allagash Wilderness Waterway. As you can see, it has a fire tower. It actually has a tower. And um, I think, it, yeah, it was like um, a mile or so, a not too difficult climb up there. 
And when I got up there, it's just one of the moments from the trip that really stands out in my memory because I could look out the windows there and I could look back and I could see everything I just struggled up through from Cockmagomic Stream and Lake. And then I could look forward the way I was about to go. And this picture in the upper right is um, Allagash Lake spread out before me. I could just see exactly how I was gonna trace the shoreline um, on the left there. And I so I, where I camped that night, if you kind of follow the shoreline there, probably just about where it disappears from view back there. There's a campsite called the Ice Cave Campsite. And there's some talus caves there that you can actually go down inside of them. And somewhere in their depths in the summertime that you can still find ice. But of course I was by myself and I really didn't venture very far into the cave. I would have gone a lot farther if I would have had the right kind of boots and I would have had somebody else there with me. But that's the place where I um, chose to write about white nose syndrome, which has impacted our bat populations here in Maine. And that's an example of, of how I try to incorporate some environmental issues as well. So after leaving Allagash Lake, then I went down Allagash Stream and um, Chamberlain Lake and Telos Lake. And Telos Lake is the, I guess, southernmost, you would say, of the Allagash Lakes. And I'd never been on that one either before. And um, here, as I mentioned before, I was following Thoreau's route in 1857. And um, it's just really fascinating to read his descriptions of places and then to go there yourself um, over 150 years later and feel the same things, see the same wildlife. Um, he talks about mergansers, which are one of my favorite water birds. Um, he calls them sheldrakes, but just his description of the way they move on the water and the way they behave is just exactly almost as the way I would have written it, which is pretty neat. And I really liked um, Webster Lake. And I had um, when I call in the book an enchanted evening there. And that's where I saw the mother deer and fawn that Arnie drew on my map. And that's a picture of them there. But it was just the most magical night because it had been like a rainy, dreary paddle to get there. And um, I had reservations. You have to make reservations for when you're gonna camp in Baxter um, four months ahead on sort of a rolling reservation schedule. So it was actually good because it, it forced me in the early spring to decide on a timeline for my trip. So I had the reservation to stay in this lean-to on Webster Lake. And I remember telling the woman when I made the reservation, I remember asking her whether there was enough room to camp there. And I said, I don't wanna stay in some mousy lean-to, even if there is one there, I wanna camp. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna use the lean-to. And she says, well, there's room to camp and you can also use the lean-to if you want to. So anyway, the afternoon I ended up arriving there, it was a steady rain all afternoon in that lean-to looked um, very good. But in the early evening, the rain stopped and I decided to go out and just paddle around on the lake just for enjoyment, not to have to try to make mileage or transport my gear or anything. And um, so I was out there in the middle of the lake and all of a sudden these two came out in an area where a stream came out and looked like it had there had been beaver activity in there and there were a lot of dead trees and, and they came right out on the shoreline and um, turned towards me and just trotted closer and closer and closer and the little fawn was nuzzling its mother and every so often they would stop to drink or eat and it was like they didn't even notice me and how they couldn't have noticed me I don't know because it was just 
my canoe out in the middle of this calm lake in plain view. And they kept on coming until they were kind of even with me on the shore. And then I guess at that point, they either saw me or decided they weren't comfortable and, and went back into the bushes. But it was a very nice, nice experience. So this is the lake um, that comes after Webster Stream called Grand Lake Matagammon. And um, half of it, about half of it is in Baxter and about half of it um, isn't in Baxter, but by the time you get to the dam at the, at the bottom end of it, you were almost in the monument. But I wanted to read this because this is an example of um, the kind of thing where you read Thoreau's words and, and you feel like they could apply to the day that you're there. The morning was a bright one and perfectly still and serene. The lake is smooth as glass, we making the only ripples as we paddled into it. The dark mountains about it were seen through a glaucous mist and the brilliant white stems of the canoe birches mingled with the other woods around it. The wood thrush sang on the distant shore and the laugh of some loons sporting in a concealed western bay as if inspired by the morning came distinct over the lake to us. And now we have arrived by boat in the monument. And the way I, the way I organize the story, um, as you'll see if you read the book, is that I actually talk about the first half of the canoe trip first. And then I talk about the backpacking trip after I've mentioned Goose and Maverick, then I tell the story of the backpacking trip so you can see how I met them. And then I go on to tell the second half of the, um, of the canoe trip. <clears throat> and um, the East Branch is, is um, it's a beautiful river and it's also a river of very different characters. The first 10 miles, um, the descent is much steeper. It descends over 200 feet in the first 10 miles. So you have a series of um, significant rapids or waterfalls or pitches that have to be portaged. And you have some really interesting water in the interludes in between the big ones. And um, then the next 10 miles, the river only drops 80 feet. And for those of you who may not do a lot of paddling, it might not seem like a big difference between 200 and some and 80, but it really um, leads to a river of a different character in the lower part. And there's an example of one of the calm spots. But this is, um, this is Grand Pitch. It's a 20 foot waterfall and the highest um, of the drops and one of the four mandatory portages that you have to do. And Grand Pitch has a campsite in, and lean to right next to it. It's a, a really nice spot to stop. Um, and this is um, the big, from the Big Savoyas campsite on the lower part of the river and just gives you an idea what, um, what it's like to, to paddle the lower part. There's a lot of um, silver maple floodplain forest, which is really beautiful. So, Coming from upstream, you would get to Stair Falls first, and then this would be the next, and it would be the first of the four mandatory portages. And this is called Haskell Rock Pitch. And I just put this in here because I think that's gotta be the most unique rock formation in the monument. It just towers over you. And um, you can see how the river is slowly eroding it away. And one of these days, I guess it's just gonna topple over. But all the rock in that area is so interesting. It's a, a conglomerate and just made up of such a mix of different sizes and shapes and types of stone. It's neat just to walk around looking at that. And the portage trails around the rapids in the monument itself are really good compared to what I found um, in the other parts of my journey, like along the uh, west branch of the Penobscot, for instance. The uh, ones in the monument are very well maintained. And the one around Haskell Rock Pitch is the longest at about half a mile. 
And there's a lot of history in the monument, as I alluded to before. Um, a lot of logging history, a lot of indigenous history, and also a couple of um, really intriguing spots that were my favorites. And the first one of them, the Little Spring Brook Fish Hatchery, there really isn't very much to see there, but just imagining what was there and researching the story of the fish hatchery so I could put it in the book was really neat. Um, it was built by a man named Charles Atkins, who was a very, very early um, fish culturist, as he called himself, and one of the first two fish commissioners for the state of Maine back in the late 1860s. And Maine was very proactive on getting on board with fisheries conservation and actually had um, a commission four years earlier than the federal government did. And the main fish hatchery for Maine was um, in Orland and it was called Craig Brook and it's still in existence today. And um, back in the early 1900s, um, Atlantic salmon fry from that hatchery in Orland were being brought on a long journey by train and buckboard to be released in the East Branch. And Charles Atkins came up with the idea of streamlining the process by bringing eggs instead of small fish to the East Branch and then having a satellite hatchery here where he could raise them until they got to the stage um, when it was ideal to release them into the river. And they wouldn't have this arduous journey and you would have be better able to control and time the release of the fish into the river when it was perfect for them to survive. And this is the only known photograph of this fish hatchery, which was in operation from 1903 to 1916. But I had a um, lot of help researching um, this part of my story by a, fish, a former fisheries biologist named Paul Johnson. And I actually got to go to Craig Brook and sit there and go through the volumes of all the historical correspondence of Charles Atkins when he was coming up with the idea and trying to convince um, the people he worked for that it was a good idea. And then even like all the details of the kind of food they ordered to feed the people that lived there, I found it very fascinating. But I was also a little sad that there wasn't very much there to see. And so as I continued down the river, I was approaching the site of one of the early farms and there were two settlers that came to settle on the East Branch in the 1830s. And they each built farms that became sort of the last outpost before people would go into the woods to do logging or they would go towards Katahdin to explore or they would do surveying or scientific exploration. And so one of the farms is called Hunt Farm. And I was really, really hoping that I could land near the site of the farm. I knew where it was, where it was located and it was a very um, easy to spot um, location because there's these really high sandy banks. So I got close to, to where I thought it was and I came around the bend and I saw the sandy banks and there was a cabin or camp right there. And I didn't want to stop right in somebody's yard. So I went a little bit further down and there was a gravel beach on the correct side of the river. And I pulled over and, and uh, beached the canoe. And I started walking around and um, just looking to see if I could, could see any indication of where the farm had been or, or anything. And um, this little glimmer of white in the river caught my eye and I waded out there and it ended up being a piece of pottery. So I spent probably an hour just walking up and down the beach and all into the into the water and along the beach and I found all this different kinds of um, pottery 
and I didn't touch any of it. I didn't move any of it. And I hope if anybody else goes there and does this little treasure hunt like I did, that they'll leave everything exactly where it was. But I have a fellow author, Jeff Ryan, um, who wrote a blurb for my book. And he said, while a map can set our course, letting the journey itself be our muse is the greatest guidance of all. And I, I think he was referring to the fact that, that I like to go out on a trip, not necessarily knowing what I'm gonna find or what I'm gonna end up writing about and just let, let it unfold and try to write in a way that people that read the book will feel like they're on the journey with me and discovering things as I do. So that was really neat. And I have a, a friend, an archeologist around here that looked at the different photographs and, and dated them for me. And um, that one in the top left, he thinks is old enough that it could have come to the Hunt Farm with the original family. Dad's given me my five minute warning. I'm almost done now. And actually speaking of dad, here's mom and dad. So that picture of them is um, taken at Chamberlain Bridge where they came to meet me for my resupply, which is something they were very well trained to do because I have to show you them. Here they, oh, you, well, you probably can't. There they are. I think there's a little picture. Isn't there a little picture of me? No. no. Oh, well, anyway, they're here. And on um, my through paddle, the NFCT, they met me four different times. And dad actually went with me um, for a week on the um, Adirondack portion of it for the first week of the trip. But they're always my support system. Uh, and, and the last day he did as well. So... I finished at Grindstone Falls. And so if I'd gone nine miles further, I would have gone to Medway, which is the point where the west and east branches combine to make the main branch of the Penobscot. So here's the book. Sometimes I forget to mention my website, which I think I did forget the first time. But anyway, that is it, lauriechandler.com. And not only can you purchase the books there, but there's also a blog from the through paddle. You can get a really good idea of what was involved with that on my blog. And I'm really pleased that my book is published and printed in Maine. I work in cooperation with Maine Authors Publishing in Thomaston. And one of the neatest things about it is just being part of a community of authors that you can attend events together and you can bounce ideas off of. And I've really enjoyed what I call the author life a lot. And if you're interested in learning more about Katahdin Woods and Waters or helping out in some way, there are um, opportunities to volunteer there through the friends. This is a uh, day of trail work on the Esker Trail off the Loop Road, which is actually the only day so far that I've gone to work, but I'm looking forward to being able to do a lot more at some point in the future. And I just put this in here because it is winter right now. And if you go on to the Friends website, there are there's a map you can download that shows the uh, cross-country skiing and snowshoe trails. And that is from a trip that I did out there last winter. So that part of the trail goes right along the East Branch on the um, upper end, on the north end. And that's it. I'm glad to answer some questions and thank you very much for coming tonight. I enjoyed it. Thank you so much, Lori. Do we have any questions? Uh, you can type questions into the chat or use the raise hand feature under participants, or if no one else is talking, just unmute yourself and ask away. Why did you use a uh, kayak paddle rather than a, a canoe paddle? I think a lot of it stems from not being a, an expert 
um, whitewater paddler more mm -hmm. than anything else. But I like to say, because I began the through paddle in the Adirondacks, there's a, a real tradition there of paddling small solo canoes with mm -hmm. a double bladed paddle. Yeah. And um, so I talk about that some in that book, but actually I'm just, I'm most comfortable that way. It gives me the best control and the best speed. And um, that's, I, yeah. it, on the first trip, on the first long trip, I also took a single bladed paddle, but I didn't end up using it very much at all. Hmm. Okay, well, I think they both have their merits. So that's good, thank you. So did you do this during the month of July, I gather from your talk? Yes, I started July 8th and ended August 1st. Yeah, so you had a few mosquitoes, I suppose. I did, but the, <laughs> the black flies were not as bad as they would have been if I'd done it a little bit earlier. On that NFC T tri trip, the first few weeks were really bad with the black flies, but I did yeah. have some mosquitoes, but I, they're not so bad out in the water and I have this real routine I do for the paddling part where I, um, I just paddle in a bathing suit and, and um, quick drying shorts and a quick drying t-shirt. But as soon as I get into camp, I swim if I'm someplace where I can. And then I just put on long, long sleeve shirt and long pants and um, <laughs> a head net if it's bad. I don't really use a lot of insect repellent if I can avoid it. Yeah, okay, good. Okay, sounds like you're a great person for the out of doors. Thanks for the talk, it was interesting. Okay. Thank you very much. On, on the portages, did you um, drag or carry the canoe or have wheels? Or? Okay, that's a great question. Um, I own wheels and on the Northern Forest Canoe Trail trip, um, there was 150 miles of portaging and 90% of it was wheelable. So I had the wheels with me everywhere except the last um, 150 miles or so through the Allagash. On this trip, not much of it would have been wheelable, so I did not take my wheels. And the canoe that I use weighs 32 pounds. It's a Winona Fusion. And um, when I have it set up for portaging, I have a portage yoke, um, lightweight wood with a foam pad that I bought and my dad made the portage yoke. And so that is clipped into the boat and I tie in my paddle. So it's 38 pounds when I'm doing a uh, carry type of portage and I can handle that pretty well. I can carry the boat about a half a mile. And if the portage is any longer than that, I just do it in stages. So the boat goes in one trip and the gear goes in a second trip. The very first long trip I did, um, Back in 2011, I was doing three trips for every carry, and um, that's not not efficient and not good. What what is the length of the uh, boat? The boat is 13 feet long, and it's 30 30 or 31 inches wide. So as far as tripping canoes go, it's kind of fat and not really. Um, streamlined, but it's also stable. And compared to the kayak that I had before the canoe, it's a lot faster than that. I'm happy with it. Thanks. You're welcome. Someone in the chat asks, what's your favorite experience in the National Monument? Hmm. I think actually Probably it was the challenge of deciding which rapids to paddle and which rapids to portage. And I was really surprised, I guess, by the amount of white water there was in between the rapids that I knew about. And I really, I really enjoyed the points where I was able to do more. Um, of difficult rapids than I thought I was going to. And then I had a favorite campsite, which is, is next to one of the four that I didn't talk about, which is called Pond Pitch. And there's a campsite that's right next to, right next to Pond Pitch. And there's a long finger rock that kind of goes out 
into the water and um, there was nobody else around. I really didn't see too many people on the river in the monument at all. And it was just that night and that particular campsite was just very meaningful to me. Kathy in the chat asks, were all the portages marked around the falls? Did you know about them before the trip? I did. They were well marked and the maps were for the most part accurate. And um, one thing I didn't mention is that the Friends is working on a paddling guide. Um, I don't know if it's called the working draft right now or um, it's a work in progress, but it's also already very, very helpful. And, and um, I would call it mostly complete at this point. And you can download that from the website as well. The places where I didn't have really good information um, were places like Webster Stream, where there just aren't a lot of um, guides or um, um, narratives of people doing, um, doing that section. And there's a lot of rapids and I really didn't know exactly what was coming up next. Um, compared to that, um, the monument was, was um, I guess I would just say I had a really, really good idea of what I was up against. Matt asks, did you do the mud pond carry the first time through? And if so, which route did you prefer? I did the mud pond carry twice. I did another trip in 2011, which was my first long one. I did it in a fishing kayak. That was the three carries per, three trips per carry trip. And I went across Maine on the Northern Forest Canoe Trail, just the, the half of it that's in Maine. So I did mud pond carry that time. And then I did it again when I did the through paddle. And I definitely prefer Allagash Lake, but I'm not sure that if you were pressed for time, you probably would be better off to do mud pond carry because to get from the point where you would leave, to get from the point where you have to decide whether to go up through Allagash Lake or to go through Mud Pond Carry, it's probably about two to three days longer to go around through Allagash Lake. Mud Pond Carry is difficult. It's almost two miles long. And the people that own it um, allow people to portage through there, but they don't want the portage to be maintained. So there's a lot of trees down over it. And it's been in use for hundreds of years, thousands of years. And basically you're trudging the whole way through water, either clear sparkling stream-like water or in some places deep murky ankle to almost knee high water where you can't see what's underneath there. It could be slippery rocks, it could be um, old sections of the corduroy road that were there. It's very treacherous and very buggy. And it's a rite of passage, but you don't really ever forget it if you did it. <laughs> Someone asks, when you used the canoe paddle, what kind of water conditions were you in? Um, calm streams. I really didn't use the canoe paddle too much, but I mean, I've done I've done canoe trips in a tandem canoe where I've used a regular canoe paddle. My dad and I have done part of the Allagash and I've done, done other various trips in Maine. I've got a lot more miles under my belt with the double bladed paddle. Excellent, if no one else has a question, I think that'll do it for tonight. Uh, thank you so much to everyone for coming and thank you so much to Loy for a really, really wonderful talk. Claire and Boris are still on here. I mean, I can't shout out all the friends of mine that are on here, but they um, went on a cruise with us called the Voyage of the Vikings to Northern Europe and they live in Alabama. And so it's really cool that through Zoom, friends like that can be here for my talk. So thanks for coming. Thanks to everybody. <laughs>